All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, we're going to start with this webinar with a little bit of light housekeeping just as we wait for attendees to join. I see the ticker going up. I'm Pauline Stern. I'm the program manager responsible for the investment monitor. The webinar is currently being recorded and a link to the recording along with slides for the presentation will be shared with attendees after the webinar. It will also be made available on the APF website, which is www.asiapacific.ca. Uh, please use the Q&A box located on the bar at the bottom of your webinar window to ask questions during the presentation. We'll address a selection of these questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar. My colleague Isaac and myself will also be, be providing written responses to a selection of questions throughout the presentation. If you have technical issues with the webinar, please message panelists in the chat box. This is a different box than the Q&A box and a member of APF staff will assist you. And if you have further questions about the investment monitor after the webinar is over or would like to discuss common research interests, please feel free to reach out to our presenter, Kai valdez Betcher, or myself, Pauline Stern. We'd be very happy to engage with you further. I will now hand over the platform for opening remarks to the president and CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation, Mr. Stuart Beck. Well, uh, thank you very much, Pauline. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and welcome to our, our friends from not just in Canada, but uh, from around the world. Uh, to our fourth annual Investment Monitor launch, uh, which is one of our signature publications at the Foundation. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, uh, which is the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, nations. Uh, I'd like to say uh, just a few words about the Foundation. Uh, the uh, Asia Pacific Foundation's focus is really on being a catalyst for engagement uh, with the Asia Pacific region, uh, also as a bridge uh, uh, to Asia. And what we have been doing for the last uh, few, I guess it's almost few months now, uh, since the, uh, the onset of the COVID situation, we've been really pivoting our work to uh, what's going on uh, in Asia, uh, as most Asian countries have been ahead of Canada in the context of what's going on. And if, uh, if I would encourage uh, people who are listening, please follow what's going on in Asia Watch. It's, it's uh, we produce this three weeks, uh, three times a week, and it really brings intelligence of what's going on in the region in a relatively easy uh, to read fashion, uh, very quick, uh, and really quite pertinent to what's going on. So please, uh, Asia Watch is one of our, again, uh, important publications that we release three times a week. Uh, before we uh, get into the, the actual presentation, and I pass the, the, uh, the baton to uh, Jeff Reeves, our VP of Research, I'd just like to thank our sponsors for the Investment Monitor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. And also, uh, which we did in partnership with, uh, uh, with the School of Public Policy, but also our sponsors, the Government of British Columbia, Advantage BC, the Bank of Canada, Export Development Canada, and Invest in Canada. And now uh, I'd like to pass uh, the mic over to Jeff Reeves, um, our Vice President of Research. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, so good morning and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Reeves. I'm the, the Vice President of Research at the Foundation. Um, before I, I turn the floor over to the business development team to do this excellent briefing on the investment monitor, I'd just like to take a minute to put this research product into perspective with the foundation's current research approach. Uh, since March, as, as Stuart said, the foundation has prioritized a research agenda looking at Asia for experiences around the COVID pandemic and pandemic responses. Uh, this has been an all hands on deck cross sectoral research approach that we've undertaken as a means to leverage the foundation's knowledge its skills and its networks to support Canada's own domestic efforts around COVID. Uh, as Stuart mentioned, we pivoted our Asia Watch newsletter to capture the best practices and challenges within Asia around pandemic response. We've also built on those daily open source reports to provide more targeted and what we hope are more actionable research products through longer pieces that we're calling COVID conversations. And we've used our networks to be part of regional dialogues around COVID, such as that that we participated in with our BC-based healthcare providers, with doctors and nurses in Wuhan, China. And you can actually read a summary of the discussions that we've been involved in on our website under the Wuhan Dialogues. Uh, with respect to the investment monitor, which we've been publishing for several years now, we're working to extract some of the data that we collect through this research effort in order to better model where and how Canadian interests in Asia are affected by specific locales responses to the pandemic. So some research products to that effect will be forthcoming uh, in a matter of weeks. Now, all this said, the, invest the investment monitor stands on its own outside of this COVID research agenda 
as an important source of information on multi-directional investment from Canada to Asia, and then from Asia back to Canada. The Investment Monitor is such as one of the Foundation's flagship publications, and its outcome is uh, the result of months of painstaking work, all with the purpose of providing greater insight into Canada's financial and commercial uh, interests across the Asia Pacific. So let me now turn the floor over to the Foundation's researchers for our Business in Asia research pillar, who are the Investment Monitor's principal authors. Uh, Pauline Stern, who introduced uh, this session earlier today, is the Program Manager for the Business Asia Pillar. Kai uh, Valdez-Betcher is the Investment Monitor's Project Lead. Isaac Lowe, Asaina uh, Mukhbat, and Phoebe Ferrer are also the Business Asia's Research associate, uh, Associates. Kai will provide the summary today, so over to you, Kai and Pauline, and thanks to the team. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jeff, and thank you, Stuart and Pauline, for leading us into this discussion today. Um, just a brief roadmap map of where we're about to go. Uh, we'll be doing a brief description about what an investment monitor is for those of you who are engaging with us for the first time. It's great to see a bunch of new organizations reach out to APF and attend this event. Uh, one of the benefits of having a webinar is that we can reach from coast to coast to coast and engage with many of our new, many new partners, many new groups across the country. After that, after we lay the lay a landscape of what the project is, we'll be examining the um, keystone research discussion of this year's annual report, which is how do free trade agreements impact FDI? We'll then be doing a discussion on inbound FDI, which is probably most relevant to many of your organizations, but also examining what happens with Canada's outbound FDI footprint in the Asia Pacific and what that means for Canada's engagement overall with the region. After that, I encourage you to send your questions and questions towards us and we'll do our best to answer them live or in text or post event as well. As we already mentioned, I'd like to especially thank the network of people who've made this possible. The School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary is our institutional partner. They've helped make sure that this is academically rigorous. They've helped make sure that we are, what we're doing speaks to deep dive policy researchers out there. But we've also really leaned on the expertise and knowledge of our sponsor network, Advantage BC, EDC, Invest in Canada, the Bank of Canada, and the Government of British Columbia. They've helped us aim for discussions on research, and they've helped us build a network of uh, business network support and policy. What is an investment monitor? Many people over the past 15 years have tried to have attempted to explain the rise of investment coming from the Asia Pacific. And they've turned oftentimes to official statistics to find ways to answer what's happening. However, we found that official sources sometimes have distinct issues in terms of flag, in terms of identifying ultimate ownership of investment, and just in terms of providing the bottom-up, detailed, cut and slice data that people need when they're making policy-related decisions on how we encourage investment to Canada from the Asia Pacific, or how we make Canada's footprint in the Asia Pacific stronger and more rigorous. Uh, the rise of China as an investor in the early 2000s spurred a lot of activity in the United States and in Europe in terms of tracking what China's been doing as an investor overall. It's a bit fear driven, a bit just engagement driven as well. But for Canada, there really hasn't been much in terms of um, usable statistics and that can supplement official statistics that deal with the issue of lag and also track issues of ultimate ownership. As much as some stats say that the Cayman Islands, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg are strong sources of investment, we know that ultimately the money is coming from other jurisdictions and around the world. And what we do with our research team, what we do on a day-to-day basis with the investment monitor's data set is to build a bottom-up transactional approach, tracking every deal that occurs between the Asia Pacific and Canada, building up a robust data set in terms of what's happening sectorally, where these locations are, where they're going, creating a point-to-point -point network of business engagement in terms of investment going back all the way to 2003. Being able to disaggregate this data in unique ways across that 17 year period has made it very interesting in terms of tracking new trends. Not just answering the traditional how much investment are we receiving, who is receiving it, who is investing, who is receiving, but also getting down to the very specific locations of that investment, the where and the very specific time frames, the when and even the what mechanisms are occurring when these investments occur. All being said, as part of APF's mandate, we're trying to do targeted, timely research on the Asia Pacific and the investment monitor is one of the key tools we use to describe our economic engagement. One of the most obvious reasons why we do this is to track things as they occur and track major economic um, interactions and events as they're ongoing. Looking back to the um, past um, decade and a half of economic history, Canada's experienced two different recessions. 
uh, technical recession in 2015 and the more commonly known 2008-2009 recession. This is not a COVID-19 webinar, so I'm not going to spend too much time dissecting what occurred in terms of recessions and experiences back then. But when we ran, when we ran the numbers on the investment monitor, we started to realize that maybe 2008 and 2009 are not the best comparator scenarios for Canada's economic engagement with the Asia Pacific more specifically. If you're looking at diversification and engagement with the Asia Pacific, lessons learned from 2015 may be more relevant for many of your institutions. Um, if you don't, if you're trying to recall what occurred after 2011's peak in price in commodities, we saw a decline and a crash in commodity prices, oil and gas especially, but also in mining and mineral, minerals. That led to a lag effect where a large amount of investment came from the Asia Pacific into Canada, buying up um, as, uh, distressed assets, buying up um, essentially um, acquiring good deals on different mines, different oil and gas organizations. But after a peak in inbound investment flows in 2013, we saw those flows drop down to a record low and uh, a near record low in 2015. Whether or not it's going to be a one to one experience in 2020 moving forward is yet to be seen. But we saw in 2008 and 2009 a strong, resilient Australia and China really drive the Asia Pacific economic region as a whole. They have essentially avoided the effects of the recession to a large extent, likely when it comes to investment coming into Canada from the Asia Pacific. Um, this time around, we'll see a very different scenario, much more in line with that commodity crash in the middle of last decade. But again, I'm just trying to move on from the COVID-19 discussion, even though that will probably pop up a few times, lessons learned um, and things of that nature. But the key main reason we're updating our report this year is to analyze free trade agreements and foreign direct investment. 2019 was the first full year of Canada's engagement in the CPTPP, so we figured it was a good time to assess whether or not a free trade agreement has had impacts on FDI. The um, logic behind this is that, at least in theory and in some observed practice elsewhere, we've seen that free trade agreements do incentivize foreign direct investment into partner economies under the agreement. Um, the theory says that investment-related texts and FTAs are important. They essentially set rules and methods to enforce the rules, ultimately leading to investor confidence. That reassurance and confidence in foreign investors is key, not just for investment reasons, but also for trade, as an investor decides whether or not to set up shop uh, to build up a supply chain and become an importer into Canada or, did, or uh, move away based on worries or concerns that some of their investments might be expropriated or maybe treated differently. So investment is key to trade. Free trade agreements are also key to investment. These are mutual relationships. So with the CPTPP being Canada's largest economic engagement in the region in a long time, it was, it's interesting to see whether or not we're able to build a baseline a description of what's occurred over the past year and see what happens when we track that forward over the coming years under CPTPP. As trade faces challenges like never before, we probably will be doing a lot more in this, just trying to figure out what that baseline is and where trade can help FDI and where investment can help uh, trade as well. So right off the bat, when we look at what's happened in terms of can Canadian investment outbound into the ratified CPTPP economies in the calendar year 2019, we see that much of the engagement, in dollar terms at least, flowed into two more familiar, more traditional economies to the Canadian mindset, Australia and New Zealand. The uptake in Japan, Singapore, and Vietnam, three other ratified economies, was much lower in terms of dollar amounts and also fairly low in terms of the number of deals. Number of deals tend to be a good metric of activity, but it's a bit disappointing to see that so far at least, Canadian outbound investors have been only regularly active in Australia. Uh, much of the Australian activity has been driven by Quebec's deposit and investment fund, so pension driven. At the same time, we've also seen private actors emerge as the key drivers of Canada's investment in New Zealand over the past year with uh, New Zealand's Vodafone uh, phone system being purchased by Brookfield. When it comes to what's happening when Canada's rec received investments from the Asia Pacific in the calendar year 2019, so the first year post CPTPP, it's a similar story in terms of Australia leading, but we see that Japan is now a uh, significant investor in Canada. Australia and Japan were much more active also in terms of deal counts than Singapore and New Zealand. No other economy really tracked in terms of engaging with Canada under the CPTPP. Again, it's the first year, this is still a baseline, but it gives us a sense of who, who are engaging with us in terms of investment protections, investment tax under the CPTPP agreement. Uh, Australia's activity over the past year into Canada has been primarily into mining. Mining projects are very capital intensive, but also have a very long lag in terms of decision-making. 
So these decisions were probably not incentivized directly by the CPTPP, just occurring within this framework. When it comes to Japan, that story is pretty much uh, entirely the story of Mitsubishi Aircraft purchasing Bombardier's regional jet program, as well as setting up its own network of locales in Montreal to, to um, build off uh, Montreal's expertise and, and Bombardier's knowledge base. So overall, when we track across time, we see that 2019 looks a bit disappointing compared to previous years. So the CPTPP does not seem to have had an immediate staggering effect in terms of dollars invested or dollar, dollars received or dollars invested abroad between Canada and the ratified CPTPP economies. Tracking performance over the past half decade, we see that 2018 is really the, was really the key year, but that was being primarily driven by a few key deals which probably aren't happening, which won't have equivalents happening, happening anytime soon. In terms of inbound investment received, the dark blue up top, much of that 8 billion was due to the LNG Canada deal, Canada's largest private deal, Canada's largest ever private deal. At the same time, we've also seen in terms of outbound investment, a large amount of that 2019 activity was due to significant large institutional investments by investors such as the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, uh, such as uh, and by the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, as well as by many Toronto-based um, banks and funds. When we look at trying to uh, develop a baseline of CPP, CPTPP FDI engagement by sector, we also see that the um, history of Bombardier pops up in the top three. So Mitsubishi's purchase led to nearly a billion dollars of bilateral FDI activity last year between Canada and Japan. We also see that the Australian driven mining story is what delivered that second place 1.2 billion invest, an investment point across the Pacific last year. So the software and computer services transaction is pretty much entirely that Vodafone New Zealand uh, transaction as well. Still, it is interesting to see that overall in terms of sectoral distribution for the first year under CPTPP, investment has been fairly diverse and diffuse into very different sectors. So it's not as if this is only incentivized or we've only seen participation uptake in one sector. It's a very broad based level of engagement and hopefully that's something that Canada can build on moving forward. Maybe a better, maybe a best comparator to look at is what happened just a few years prior to CPTPP. Uh, one of the closest comparator in the region is um, the Canada Korea Free Trade Agreement, which uh, was, went into effect on January 1st of 2015. So just uh, four years before the CPTPP went into effect. We dissect this more into the report but there is an indication that flows do seem to increase between the pre and post uh, ratification of free trade agreement over time. So it may just be that 2019 was too early. And certainly the 2020 economic context that we're currently facing will probably mean the effects of CPTPP will not be easily identifiable in terms of everything else that's occurring in the Canada Asia Pacific economic engagement story right now. However, if we're looking at free trade agreement engagement, if we're looking at the irrelevance and usefulness of investor investment promotion agencies and investment attraction agencies learning more about these texts it may be that you'll start to, if you develop the skill sets to really read between the lines of cptpp and figure out how that helps out local investors in your region there may be longer term plays that lead to the effects that we saw under the canada korea free trade agreement where in both inbound and outbound investment uh terms dollars and flowed at a greater rate than in the 2010 to 2014 period. Now, many of you are here to focus, uh, as representatives of agencies, just focus almost exclusively on inbound foreign direct investment. Um, but then there's a lot of activity in Canada occurring around this right now, especially as we see a risk of decoupling for at least in the short term and potentially long-term impacts of an economic recession or at least COVID-19 induced um, impacts in regional sectors across the Pacific. That being said, we're also going to I'm going to emphasize that inbound lessons can also be applied to outbound foreign direct investment and vice versa because there seems to be interesting compatibility and interesting trends that map well between both levels of investment. So I encourage you to learn from both this section, but also see what is relevant for the next one as well. Uh, the good news in terms of inbound investment, the numbers that the headline numbers that most people care about in terms of how much Canada is receiving from the Asia Pacific is that dollars are up across periods. All of these dollars have been adjusted up to um, 2019 Canadian dollar terms, inflation adjusted. Uh, potentially more important though is the level of engagement that we're seeing across time. So as much as it's great to see that 47 billion received in 2012 through 2015 took up to 56 billion in 2016 through 2019, the fact that since the 2008 to 2011 period we've seen consistent, a consistent rise in the number of deals and the number of activity may bode well for long-term engagement between, between Canada and the Asia Pacific because it means that there is a broad base of Asia Pacific investors making repeated activities 
or unique investors making one-off deals but at a greater number than in previous periods. Um, this engagement hopefully will continue post the effects of the COVID-19 related economic shocks, but it's good to see that at least in this, in this um, frame, frame of mind, Canada is moving forward in its engagement of investment dollars to see. When it comes to specific sectors though, it's a different story of the most recent four-year period. Canada is still very reliant on a few key commodity sectors to drive its investment dollars received. Unsurprisingly though, as oil and gas production and mining are very uh, capital intensive sectors, very capital intensive fields, and they have they require a lot more funds just to become viable options. At the same, at the same time, we're seeing that industrial goods and services in the most recent four-year period has still maintained remains strong. Industrial engineering has been is, has up at the top right, those blue boxes there, has been a very pan-Canadian effort with activity, strong levels of activity in Prince Edward Island, Manitoba, BC, and Ontario and Quebec as well. So it's not just um, main key locales. We're also seeing that in terms of the, we're also seeing, of course, the Bombardier deal reflected in the very upper rightmost quadrant with um, aerospace and defense, uh, over one billion invested in the most recent four-year period. Healthcare equipment and services, obviously very top of mind now, has received 1.7 billion invested into Canada over this most recent four-year period, um, as well with pharmaceuticals at 404 million, taking over the entire healthcare sector, broader industry over, in, over 2 billion received over the most recent four-year period. Software and computer service investment has obviously been top of mind for many in terms of headline creation and just tracking how Canada engages with the Asia Pacific uh, and the new economy of the 2020s. It's good to see that we received two billion in investment in the most recent four-year period, where the technology, hardware, and equipment being in another over a billion dollars in that period. For consumer goods and services, uh, automobiles and parks is primarily an Ontario story. But it's good to see that other service sector economies, travel and leisure in terms of personal goods, beverages, foods, and entertainment have all started to take a bigger slice of the, of the pie, so to speak, than what we saw in the previous years when it was much more energy, much more mining and chemicals dependent. Uh, for just a note for the Vancouver audience in particular, when we talk about real estate investment and services close to the bottom right, we're not talking about private household transactions which tend to dominate the news and lead to a lot of speculation. Quite honestly, that's a very messy field to dissect and disaggregate. We're only talk, we only focus on commercial investment activities for all these sectors, but especially when it comes to real estate investment, what we're looking at is a commercial entity and a commercial entity engaging in an investment relationship. We're not trying to describe any private level activity. But even at the commercial level, we've seen 1.8 billion coming into Canada from the Asia Pacific over the most recent four-year period. As much as Canada sometimes views itself as a very um, agriculture and forestry oriented locale though, the bottom right blue squares represent fishing and animal production at the top and the remainder of agriculture and forestry towards the bottom. We haven't seen much engagement into dollar terms into Canada from the Asia Pacific in those sectors, primarily due to the fact that we're not very competitive vis-a-vis -vis what options exist within the Asia Pacific and where they can invest abroad. Also due to Canada side effects of restrictions and Canada side protectionist um, legislation in those sectors. So as much as Canada sometimes views ourselves as leaders in those areas, we're much more an oil and gas and mine and some new services economy still in terms of how Asia Pacific, the Asia Pacific invests into Canada. One of the things that I enjoy about the investment monitors um, data set though is that it doesn't just dis disaggregate between locale or dissect um, trends between sectors, but it also gets into details that sometimes are more top of mind for the Canadian public than just the amount of dollars received and exactly which sector goes into. Um, often the discussion in Canada focuses less on these dollars and more on narratives on who's investing and how are they investing. Uh, whenever APF Canada conducts polling on investment and whenever comparator institutions have reviewed uh, and surveys and polling on foreign direct investment, it seems that issues of state ownership and issues of Canada lo potentially losing control over assets tend to peak Canadians interests in ways that just the dollar amounts don't necessarily do. However, it seems that a lot of Canadian narratives on incoming FDI were formed at an earlier time as, as Asia Pacific investment started emerging into Canada and became prominent at, in terms of high deal flows, but just prominent also in terms of newspaper headline creation. We're seeing that those narratives that were formed in the 2012 to 2015 period don't necessarily hold. So while it's true that if you were receiving a dollar from an Asia Pacific investor in the first part of the last decade, 
it was like more likely than not going to be coming from a state-owned enterprise. In the most recent four-year period, that's shifted completely, that's shifted greatly. Now the majority of engagement and activity comes from non-state-owned enterprises into Canada. This is implications for how investment attraction agencies and investment promotion groups seek to frame the narrative around investment, because perhaps there are relevant concerns about state-owned enterprise investments in Canada, or, or perhaps there's a different level of engagement that we need to do to attract these investments or redirect attention around these investments. At the same time, though, if you're only allocating resources towards state-owned enterprise um, policy creation, you're not really reflecting the fact that in terms of dollars received over the most recent four-year period, much more of this activity is coming from smaller private level entities coming from the Asia Pacific engaging in Canada, often at a repeated level. Similarly, method of entry, whenever polling has been done, it seems that Canadians are more amenable towards greenfield investment. So the creation of things that are more physical in a sense, the development of a mine, the creation of a factory, or even just the, the um, opening up of 7-Eleven or Husky station, Husky gas stations in the area. It's a physical thing where people can see the economic activity occurring. They see local labor effects, they see local income and employment effects. All of these things, things seem to spur more Canadian willingness to engage in Asia Pacific, with Asia Pacific investors. m and has, has those connotations of control, of losing national champions, of running out of Canadian competitors, competitiveness. But again, that slice of the pie is slowly, has been decreasing across the last decade. And we can expect that this might, we can potentially expect this to continue moving forward as well. For those, for those framing policy responses, to the Asia Pacific investment. Again, it's important to not just build your responses based on what occurred back when these things were first emerging as narratives, first emerging as policy issues, but also make sure that we're updating our responses, updating our data, updating the information that we're gathering to figure out how many resources we allocate into encouraging or discouraging types of investment and how many resources we should be doing to raise discussions and clarify the um, discourse in Canada around investment coming into the country. The APF Canada Investment Monitor is also very good at disaggregating down to very specific jurisdictions. Oftentimes, official statistics, whether they're from Asia Pacific Economic Partners and their own state agencies, or even within Canada at times, these uh, statistics don't drill down to a very unique local area. And again, this we're not going to go through every city within Canada right now, but just um, looking at the broad-based trends, whenever we run these slides for the um, large metropoles within any Canadian province, we find that there's a very big difference between what's experienced in terms of dollars received within the main city and what's received in, within, across the province versus Canada. So it's true, if you're in Vancouver creating economic policy just for Vancouver co uh, context, you're gonna see that many of, of the invested dollars received into Vancouver over the 2003 to 2019 period have been coming from mainland China. However, if you are a provincial or federal officer in Vancouver, trying to apply whatever anecdotes, whatever observed activity you see on the streets of Vancouver to a broader geography, you might be reallocating your resources or you might be missing out some of the other sides of the pie. Because that 71% in Vancouver that you observe shrinks down to 35% to 40%, depending on whether you're in the province of BC or talking about investment overall in terms of Canada. And that potentially means a lot of missed opportunities. At the Canadian level, you see that 6% slice of South Korea not at all reflected at all in the Vancouver pie. These are all large potential opportunities that might be occurring outside of Main Street, downtown Vancouver, or if we move off to Toronto, it's a similar story, where mainland China is a, is a dominant actor in terms of dollars invested into Toronto specifically, but that shifts greatly if you look at a pan Ontario response where Japan becomes the lead investor. And even when you go back to the Canadian response, that slice of the mainland China pie is different. I'm aware that many of the um, people listening in today are representatives of of provinces um, and I know that those that the are important for FDI attraction and lead many of these discussions for the sake of time today and just um, to reflect the fact that this is discussed in great deal to another report I'll be moving very quickly through the provincial slides but we've also had great opportunities in the past to do follow-up presentations to multiple provinces um, we've used the end of well we, we've really using the end of the decade to sort of assess a baseline and kind of compare exactly how provinces have responded to investment over the past decade uh, so we, here we see in the bit of British Columbia story, it's been a, essentially a tale of two provinces. When we go to Ontario, Quebec, we see that it's been a slight uptick in terms of both investment, in terms of both provinces, in terms of investment received. 
Uh, and when it comes to other Atlantic Canada jurisdictions, it's a bit of a mixed story. Whenever we talk to provinces, though, we try to make sure that we can disaggregate our data, speak better to what specific sectors, what specific trends are occurring over time, which cities and locales are having a point to point engagement. The prairies and territories, again, we've seen a mix of, of investment trends over the decade, uh, 169 to 565 in Manitoba. Saskatchewan has increased its investment received in terms of new flow between the time periods assessed. But really drilling down to the city level and that point to point engagement, too. One of the things that I find useful about the APF Canada Investment Monitor is that it allows you to see exactly which source cities are leading to which destination cities in Canada and which ones have just built off one-off deals or one-off sets of transactions and which ones are potentially a result of more economic engagement, successful economic activity, economic engagement by Canadian partners, or just um, very complementary sectors, very complementary industry level investments between the two. Um, so we see that with under this point-to-point -point relationship, the top 10 locales and coming, the top 10 sources, pardon me, of investment coming from the Asia Pacific are a mix of familiar names, but also not necessarily household names to the Canadian public. In, in the top, even in the top 10, you see names like Nanyang, Kuala Lumpur, and Toyota Japan as key sources of investment, ones that not necessarily key to discussions at a broader context in Canada, but are very important in terms of uh, Asia Pacific investment and to get into the country over the past 17 year period. We've also seen that there's, but these are just the um, top 10. As we tick down the list, we've tracked 185 sources in the Asia Pacific. So while the, these top 10 may be critical for many different economies, finding those going down the list of the 185, close to 200 source cities, we find many different interesting case studies, um, many different examples of successful engagement over the 17 year period or over the most recent four year period that have been very useful to analyze which economies are doing well. Similarly, when we look at the Canada side, we've seen close to 200 Canadian cities receive investment from the Asia Pacific. It's not just um, Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal that are leading the pack. Uh, we have, I believe, 191 Canadian cities or um, municipal equivalents over the 17-year period. Obviously, Western Canada has been um, uh, is very resource sector focused. It's seen a lot of the capital intensive flows of investment go into the resources. That's not just a story for the Northern BC and Northern Alberta economies of Kitimat and Port Mac, but it's also uh, displayed in terms of the mining industry's headquartering effects in Vancouver and the oil and gas industry within downtown Calgary. Likewise, however, when we shift towards Eastern Canada, it's a bit more diffuse. The story of Woodstock and Cambridge is primarily due to the auto industry. Toronto as the um, investment hub of Canada, so investment capital of Canada, so to speak, has seen a lot of the institutional investor engagement occur through its down its streets, but it also has a bit more of a diverse um, city level investment portfolio than most other cities in Canada. Montreal as well has a very diverse uh, city level portfolio of investments in terms of sectors and in terms of engagement from partner economies. This is also the first year that we're disaggregating down to the rural level of investment in the investment under annual report. Uh, we're, with um, 61 uh, rural locations in Canada receiving investment overall over the 17 year period, and we're defining rural based on Statistics Canada's definition. So you'll see a lot of resource intensive activities there, especially at the top of the top 10, with Kitimat, Dubonnet, Fort Nelson, and uh, Labrador Trough all, all relying on either oil and gas or mining extraction activities. However, it's interesting as you go down the list of the, the full list of the 61 to see exactly what case studies, what love, what successful, very local point-to-point -point, um, engagement stories are occurring with other rural uh, jurisdictions within Canada in terms of attracting Asia Pacific investment. Because while these in, um, these locations in Canada have received close to five hundred million dollars apiece, some of these places may have received hundred million, at least or a few rounds of tens of millions of dollars, and that might be sufficient for some very interesting economic activity stories down there. Now we're switching to outbound FDI, and again, it's important to understand inbound, both because a lot of the times in the Canadian media and even the Canadian policy landscape, whenever we talk about investment with the Asia Pacific, it's described as an inbound activity, but there's also that narrative of reciprocity and equal treatment when Canadians go abroad that tends to dominate discussions. And those are important discussions to have, but we are just looking at the data for what we've seen over the past 17 years to try to flesh out those narratives a bit better. The point-to-point -point relationships between Canada and the Asia Pacific in terms of outbound investment is also pretty interesting to analyze because it shows us to kind of expand our network of investment partners to kind of see where Canadians have gone abroad before, 
to see if there are economic linkages that might not have been tracked in previous discussions. Uh, it's a bit disappointing to see that in terms of Canadian investment going abroad in the Asia-Pacific, we've seen a decline not just in dollar terms, but also a long-term um, decline in the number of deals. So that level of engagement by Canadian investors has been decreasing over time. Uh, it's probably, pro probably driven by the fact that the Asia-Pacific region overall has become a much more competitive destination for Canadian investors as opposed to in the early part of this century. That being said, we we'll probably also have a bit of the effect of Canada's wariness to engage in the region. Uh, we've seen that effects reflected not just in terms of those dollars received, but just in that decline um, in terms of yeah, that deal activity. That being said, as Canadians go abroad, our footprint is a lot more diverse in terms of sectors Canadians are investing in the Asia Pacific. Uh, when, when we look at the footprint though, we need to, again, build in those narratives of reciprocity and figure out how uh, if some of the things that we raise red flags at home are being reflected in Canada's activities abroad. When, as for, for example, as when Canadians go abroad as into the Asia Pacific as investors, we are seeing that there are large sums of money going into real estate, industrial transportation, so that's key linkages like railroads, ports, and the like. We're seeing that Canadians are also investing um, towards the middle bottom into software and computer services, towards top right into electricity, health equipment and services, and even buying up some areas of real estate investment trusts and buy, investing into the banking sector as well. These are beneficial investments to Canada in terms of dollars and economic activity seen back in Canada. These are probably also bringing strong benefits to many different locales and economies across the Asia Pacific too. But when we let narratives of reciprocity in terms of inbound investment cloud our understanding of what's happening in terms of outbound investment, we run the risk of potentially raising red flags for our economic partners abroad as well. Because it may be that if we start to raise this flag too hard or without giving a very, um, without giving a very specific uh, uh, data-driven level of response, we're gonna, we, will might, we might see that other governments across the Asia Pacific will start to run the numbers in Canada's investment activity abroad and say, wait, you're criticizing us for these type, types of investment, but you are doing the same here into these sectors. What is the difference? Understanding what the differences are needs to be not just doing by the sector level stuff, the discussion, but also very much a transaction level approach to explain why Canada should or shouldn't respond to inbound investment when we are doing the similar equivalent outbound investment activities. That also um, is reflected in terms of Canada's act investment activities. Again, these are in dollar terms adjusted to 2019. Increasingly, Canada is becoming the potentially scary state-owned driven investor in the Asia Pacific. Increasingly, we're also seeing that issue of mergers and acquisition increase as Canada's dollar footprint in the Asia Pacific is being driven more and more so by mergers and acquisition activity, and less so that potentially more lo locally well-received greenfield investment activity. Now, there are almost definitely very key differences between a state-owned enterprise within Canada investing in the Asia Pacific and some of the most um, concerning state-owned enterprises coming into Canada from the Asia-Pacific. That being said, if we're going to have these discussions, it has to be based on data that's not just, that isn't just um, developed off um, anecdotes or offhand comments or even stats dating back to the 2012 to 2015 period. We need to be constantly updating our discussions and our narratives to make sure that we're responding in kind and engaging with Asia-Pacific economies in a way that allows for a better discussion, so to speak, a more healthier data-driven discussion. The ownership story is, is driven primarily by the rise of Canadian state-owned funds, whether pension or asset management funds. Again, we can discuss how their ownership structures may vary greatly compared to Asia Pacific equivalents, but these discussions need to also be occurring in terms of how we track that and disaggregate it. Um, the method of entry story is not so much that can Canadians might be wanting to, just might be just naturally inclined to do more M&A activity now, but a lot of the cheap, easier to access greenfield investment activity um, essentially Canada's being priced out of many of the main streets within the region and even in second and third tier smaller cities it's becoming a lot more difficult for Canada to just easily set up a factory, develop a mine as economies mature and their own investment uh, trajectories adjust in the Asia Pacific. Some of their willingness to accept Canadian investment in greenfield, uh, in greenfield sectors has adjusted or pivoted. Again the provincial story is very interesting. Um, we can break it down and more detail later during the Q&A, but it's a bit concerning to see that in some provinces, engagement has declined at, as, as broad-based, Alberta and BC, in terms of dollars invested into the region. 
we've seen a drop from the 2010 through 2014 period, the first half of the last decade, to the most second half until they're approximately equivalent. Ontario and Quebec, however, have been increasing. Quebec's looks small compared to Ontario, but it's still a significant rise in terms of investment going abroad. Ontario, though, we've seen a bit of those effects of having Toronto as a headquarter of many large Canadian funds. We've seen the effects of those funds now going abroad, purchasing uh, or acquiring or investing in different activities across the Asia Pacific. It will be interesting to see how Ontario's numbers potentially diverge during the current COVID-19 crisis, as many asset, as many distressed assets in the Asia Pacific might be very interesting purchases um, for um, institutional investors who have longer term risk horizons, who have the ability to wait out the storm for four years, seven years, 10 years, or even longer, and buy things at a much lower rate, than, at a much more discounted rate than what they would have had even three months ago. With the Atlantic and Prairie provinces, it's a bit of a mixed bag. No other jurisdictions outside of the um, four shown before and the four shown on the slide have been invested in the Asia Pacific over the last decade. Again, that point-to-point -point narrative is useful for all economic related agencies within Canada because even if you're just focusing on inbound investment, it's still very useful to see where Canadians are going abroad. Uh, so for the top 10, four of them are outside of southern Ontario. Uh, very broad-based sectors coming from Vancouver, Montreal, Edmonton, and Cal Edmonton overall. Calgary has been primarily an oil and gas investor in the Asia Pacific region of the 17-year period we're assessing here. Southern Ontario is a bit more of a mixed bag. Um, for the for the um, jurisdictions outside of Toronto, it's been a mix of auto investments, but also investments into solar power projects in the Asia Pacific region, especially in, in terms of South Asia. Toronto, again, as the FDI, as the investment capital, as the um, business capital of Canada, so to speak, we've seen a lot of the uh, fund activities drive up its ranking to the point where it's um, the top just uh, top source of investment to the Asia Pacific with under the nine billion. Overall, though, we have. 97 Canadian cities investing in the Asia Pacific. So it's not just these top 10 narratives, it's many very distinct local jurisdictions making decisions to support investors going abroad or unique business opportunities emerging for, very, um, for different groups outside of the main metropoles of Canada. The um, biggest network of investment um, cities though is the destination cities of Canada's outbound investment. To date, we've tracked 474 cities in the region which have received Canadian FDI since 2003. That's close to 500 um, different levels of networks that, are, that might not be tracked in terms of broader based official statistics. Again, many of these names are familiar to many in Canada, but some of these names might be unfamiliar to specific parts of the business community, even just uh, unfamiliar to many of the um, actors within very niche sectors as well. So again, there's this opportunity mapping, there's this where have Canadians gone before, and where there's this um, baseline assessment that we can do with the investment monitor that's very interesting. Again, all of these um, things can be um, driven, can be analyzed and discussed more based on our data and research presented on the investmentmonitor.ca dedicated site to this report. We're, ha we're happy to announce that we uploaded the report late yesterday afternoon, so feel free to peruse and look at everything in greater detail. We also have a lot of data visualizations, so you can essentially replicate many of the graphs, many of the graphics, many of the trends that we discussed today to a much more granular detail for your specific jurisdictions, for your specific areas or sectors of interest as well. Um, today, we've looked at how FDI and FDF and free trade agreements have interacted and got a, got a baseline on the CPTPP, but also seen how the Canada Korea Agreement may provide a roadmap for assessing how well the CPTPP does in terms of FDI incentivizing over this time. We've also reviewed inbound investment, demystifying some aspects of it and describing how the change, landscape is changing both in terms of sectors, but also across the different provinces and cities that we've seen engagement in. We've also reviewed outbound investment, its shifts, and what that, how that relates back to Canada and why we need to figure out exactly what we want to talk about in terms of narratives of reciprocity or narratives of engagement to make sure that we're engaging in robust economic engagement with the Asia Pacific. All this again has been possible thanks to our partners and sponsorship network to help in focusing these questions and helping answer the and helping us answer some of the um, most pressing issues in terms of investment has been very useful all the way till now and we know that as 2020 continues to shape in new and novel ways we will be leaning on them a lot more in terms of refining the questions defining the ways we answer these things to make sure that especially in this current context we can be very focused very policy relevant and very active on this space We'll now be opening up to questions, but um, please feel free to also engage with us 
help with questions at any time, you can reach out to us uh, via our social media networks, but also via email. Pauline Stearns' email is there. My email is there as well. We're happy to discuss any post event engagement activities. We again, we've done great work engaging with our different partners and different um, levels of jurisdictions to explain exactly what's happening within your community, within your geography or sector of interest all to just demystify and explain exactly what's happened over the past 17 years and give us a baseline of engagement for what's happening over the next year, two years, five years. Again, thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you so much, Kai. A great presentation. So we're opening up to a few questions now. We have about 15 minutes. So I'll kick off the first question. Of investment coming from China versus India has been historically and in the more recent recent four year period. Pauline, would you mind repeating that? I think you were cutting out at least in my audio at the start. I'm not sure if people heard exactly what you said. I'll just saying. repeat the entire question. So it's Thank from you. Yves Tabergen, a professor of political science at the University okay. of British Columbia. And he would like to know the breakdown of investment into Canada from China and India over the history of our investment monitor, but also more specifically over the last short four year period. Uh, especially over the last short four-year period, China's investment and engagement with Canada has been much more suppressed than what we saw in the earlier parts of the uh, 2010s in particular. Um, as state-owned enterprises in, emerged from China, and we're following a go-out policy and following out very different um, Beijing-driven incentives to invest. They invested a lot into very capital-intensive sectors, oil and gas in particular, but due to a mix of potentially burdensome economic policies, um, a lack of competitiveness, but also just a very different market than what they thought they were buying into. As commodity prices collapsed, many of these investments didn't seem to be very viable. And we've seen that China's investment portfolio in Canada has shifted from that state-owned investment um, history into natural resource uh, sectors into a much more repetitive trickle of private-driven investments into a more broad-based level of sectors. We've seen China's investments emerge in the entertainment and communication sectors a bit more. Obviously, there are, there are discussions about what future investments will be coming from China as well. We've also seen, though, that China has played a role in some of the biggest transactions in terms of commercial real estate and in terms of healthcare over the past four-year period. So it's become a much more diverse set of economic engagement activities by China. For India, there's less so of an obvious trend, just because India's investment activities seem to be very firm-based, very sporadic. And whatever sector to sector relationships that may emerge don't seem to play out beyond a few key partners. What we can say is that for India, there's been a lot of interest in attracting investments to clean tech and into clean technologies and technologies overall within their economy. And we've seen some reciprocal effects of those coming into Canada's invest into India's investment in Canada over the most recent four year period. It's still very ad hoc, it's still very um, not specific at this time, but there may be a trend emerging within the new technology sectors. Great. Um, I see a few questions popping up about state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. So I'll follow up with a question on state-owned enterprises. I'll pick one of the questions. Um, Serena Ko from the Trade Commissioner Service would like to know about the kind of shift in the breakdown between state-owned enterprises and non-state-owned enterprises and how that's evolved and what impact that has had on the mix of investment coming into Canada. Great. Um, so I think I covered part of that in the most recent response. Uh, again, state ownership is Drop in term, has dropped in terms of new dollars received over time. Uh, that's been primarily a China-driven story. However, we, are, we have admittedly seen some state ownership coming from Southeast Asia increasing. The LNG Canada deals, um, Malaysian stakeholder Petronas is a state-owned energy major in, from Malaysia. And we've seen that they made a very big play in the 2018 period. The composition in terms of just where state ownership is going within Canada has been primarily still into the um, natural resource sectors, oil and gas, mining, areas which for multiple different reasons within East Asian, and Southeast Asian economic histories have, have acquired or have been adapted to see lots of state-owned funds emerge. They're very capital intensive, they have long plays, so they maybe weren't amenable to private investors entering early on, but these majors still exist and they're still the ones that have, are engaging with Canada. Overall, in terms of dollars received though, that share, those amounts are dropping over time and we're likely not going to see a similar flow anytime soon. All right. 
Um, and I see one from Hugh Stevens that's asking the flip side of the question. Mm -hmm. Hugh Stevens is our Distinguished Fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation, and he's wanting to know a bit more about state of enterprise Canadian SOE investment in the Asia Pacific, what we mean when we say Canadian SOE um, and what that looks like. We look at the um, charter text, we look at the um, associated establishment text for the organizations that are coming out of Canada. Many of the uh, many Canadian pension funds, but not all, are legally a state-owned enterprise, even if we can distinguish between Canadian SOEs and maybe comparative economies across the Asia-Pacific. We're also seeing that some of the um, other funds, let me just find that trend slide. We're also, we're also seeing that some of the other large funds coming from Canada, such as the um, Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, are also, according to the organization, state-owned. Again, there may be very obvious differences between their activities and other state-owned enterprise activities, but these firms have large amounts of funds, they're looking for essentially new assets in emerging economies where, where activities and investment opportunities are increasing over time. But they're also dropping a lot of investment dollars into Australia, a very stable comparative economy overall, where a long play over 10, 20 years, we'll see lots of growth in terms of pension funds, in terms of retirement dollars. So they're looking at a very long term time horizons, and that's where we're seeing a lot of this state owned quote unquote enterprise activity from Canada emerge. Great. Uh, another distinguished fellow, Deanna Horton, would like to know about the difference in trends between manufacturing and service-oriented firms. Um, is there a difference in the dollar value, in the distribution? I'm not sure whether the question is more focused on inbound or outbound, so maybe you could address both directions. Okay. Um, man manufacturing and service-related. Mm -hmm. Service-related investments tend to be much smaller than manufacturing just due to the capital needs of any investment activity. So a lot of the um, manufacturing investment activity has typically been relating around greenfield investment, the actual physical setting up of a larger asset or buying one of those assets under management groups at a much higher level than you would need to do to enter the service economy within Canada. And that also goes for Canada's engagement abroad. One of them is just much more expensive to engage with versus the other. Um, so that means that when we look at manufacturing activity, a lot of the large point-to-point -point connections, some of those cities that we were showing on earlier slides, they're driven by very sustained manufacturing relationships, say Toyota Japan heading down to Southern Ontario over the decade and the 17 years we're assessing here. That's a very, that's a very long stream of larger investments occurring over time. We don't see really any equivalents in the service industry yet, but aside from some very one-off sectors, if you include say 7-Eleven stores, which are Japan um, headquartered, those would be maybe the most obvious Canada side investment activity. We're seeing that some equivalent storefront activity in terms of new um, familiar um, new familiar storefronts such as Muji, such as uh, other retail investments have become a bit more prevalent, but those are still developing. They're still very concentrated in a few key cities. Great. There's a couple questions to do with the kind of security element, the Invest in Canada Act, or mm -hmm. the United States, um, asking if we catalog categorize investments um, on a security basis or if, if we kind of view things through uh, natural resource um, sovereignty? Those are partly just by being able to disaggregate down to a subsector level, we can track very closely within, um, track down to which sectors are being targeted by some of these policies. Um, I'm aware that very recently Canada's created a very new list of sectors that they want to protect, at least for the short to medium term in terms of um, protect from investment, foreign direct investment into those sectors just to ensure that they stay within Canada. One of the things that I'd I'm very curious about analyzing just dissecting that narrative a bit more and figuring out which ones, where, where we've seen some of these um, plays impact in the past. Uh, really though, the biggest change to Canada's security, uh, Investing Canada Act has been surrounding some of the natural resource investment proposals or completed deals in the early 2010s. It's very hard to, uh, to disaggregate the impacts of the legislation, which occurred at pretty much the exact same time that the commodity cycle peaked and then started to crash. So we really haven't had a playbook yet for what might may happen in terms of other changes to the Investment Canada Act. A few key deals in terms of technology sectors may be hampering some economic engagement from the Asia Pacific into Canada, but these tend to be very comparable to what's happening in Europe and the United States at this time. So we're not able to see if there's anything shifting Canada versus any comparative economies. Fantastic. I see that we're in the last few minutes of our webinar 
um, hour long allotment. So I'll just take these few minutes to say thank you so much, Kai, for your informative presentation and for taking time to answer Q&A questions. And if there's any further questions that we haven't had time to address in this webinar, please shoot either of us an email or call us or when, when our office is open, please come for a visit. Um, we're happy to continue this conversation. We think it's a very important area of research for Canada to understand better as this relationship in two-way investment flows is growing and as Canada kind of looks towards uh, economic relations with the Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.